All right, welcome everyone. Today we have a special guest. It's Russell Manser. We wanted to invite him on because he's done some absolutely incredible work in the community with his business, which is Voice of a Survivor. Um, Russell was at the Royal Commission um, testifying and he's just got like an amazing story of healing and what's possible for all survivors. So thank you for joining us, Russell. Thanks for having me on, Gabby. So good to have you here. I really appreciate it. It's yeah, good. Absolutely. I really like the work that you're doing too, Gabby. I really appreciate, you know, your passion and and and, and, and your drive to really to bring attention to the, you know, child trafficking and child abuse. I think it's, uh, you know, is, you know, we need more people like you in this world, you know. No, oh, thank you. I think if we if we all do our bit right, it's all gonna meet up and we're gonna change. Yeah, a massive. Change. I talk about it. I talk about, I, you know, when I. One of the things that I, I talk about, um, and I talk about a perpetrator's greatest weapon is, is, is the, the victim or the survivor's silence and shame. And I think, sure you know, um, that's the greatest weapon. It really is. They rely on people, you know, not talking about or being feeling too ashamed and embarrassed uh, to talk about it. And, you know, and I can tell you in my own case, you know, um, you know uh, that happened for a long time of being, being a, 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 you know, being a, being abused. I, I was, I, I was um, fourteen years old. I was sent to the notorious Derek Boys Home, which is a subject to a sixty-minute story, and 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 perpetrators later being charged uh, as a subject uh, as a as, because of the sixty-minute story exposing them. And um, I, I went to Derek uh, Boys Home for a misdemeanor offence, uh, being just I think it was an attempted car steal or something like that. And uh, you know, I was um, I was sexually sexually abused. I went to Derek Boy's home. I wouldn't say a well-rounded kid or anything like that, but I was a kid that sort of looked after myself, you know, just kept a little bit fit, was engaged in sport. Yeah. I um, I don't come from an antisocial family. I'm the youngest of six kids. They were English immigrants. Um, none of my other siblings have ever engaged in any social behaviour and um, sort of a little bit out of the ordinary for someone like myself to sort of get into trouble. And um, so I went to Derek. Um, Derek was a really brutal place. Mm. Um, the, I, you know, I, I, I often think about that. It was, it was so, so prolific, the abuse, the sexual abuse at Derek. Um, uh, and, 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 and like there was these old women there that were there. They were, they were called matrons and they had one in every, like there was four units there and uh, they're like they were dormitory type units, and there's old, old, old women there that looked after the clothing and the towels and the sheets and that sort of stuff. And they, and, and you know, and to think, and I knew, like at, at the end of it, I knew that they were aware because I know a lot of kids had complained, thinking there yeah. was an old motherly type woman in there, and she might be able to, and, and they were told to go away and stop telling lies. And yeah, so they so, you know, were assisting what was going on by looking the other yeah. way. For sure, I was, I was, you know, um, obviously uh, the the abuse itself changed the way I I, I seen the world. I um, after the abuse, I, I I sort of had a void in me. I had a, I don't know, a real emptiness in me, and there seemed to be um, uh, a darkness about me after there. Mm -hmm. And then um, I left there, and I started. I'd never really been a kid that touched drugs or anything like that, and I started. Uh, you know, smoking my pot and then mm. using speed, and then. Uh, uh, but what I did learn out of Derek was, um, you know, it was sort of like a college of knowledge about you know how to do different crimes. I learned how to steal Porsches there, <laughs> and um, you know, and, you um, yeah. Well, you know, two years later, I was released from Derek, and two years later, I, I was arrested uh, for stealing a Porsche over in the affluent areas of um, of Sydney, and and. Um, I went before a, a children, uh, children's uh, court judge at, at the Jura Children's Court and uh, he sentenced me to 12 months and he stipulated to be served in an adult prison as a, as a, as a deterrent, you wow. know. Um, uh, uh, you know, I was sent to Long Bay and I was housed in the one-wing section of the Central Industrial Prison at Long Bay. Now, Central Industrial Prison was a protection wing that only housed, you know, uh, sex offenders, in, in particular pedophiles. Uh, two negrophiliacs were there at the time, people who had sex with dead bodies, uh, like ex-policemen or, or people that were crown witnesses in court cases. And it wasn't a, a particularly safe place 
to, to, to put a 16 year old uh, I was, I was child. Just ask, she was 16. Yeah, I was 16. So yeah. I was 16. And, you know, I've got a photo now, like at home, uh, of me as a 16 year old. And I, you know, I would have been lucky to be 48 kilos, mm. um, uh, 48 kilos. And um, uh, they, um, and, you know, I was subjected, but as soon as I got there, like, I'd never had the strip search in front of two men and, 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 and I felt really humiliated. And I, I just, cool. even from that stage there, even some of the comments that the, uh, the staff were making uh, about me, like, you know, uh, that was sex, uh, sexual in, in nature, uh, talking about, you know, the boys are going to love you. And, um, it's horrific, isn't it? You know, it's crazy. It's crazy. And, um, you know, so um, that night they put me, uh, they give me a mattress to put in a cell. Uh, they put me in a cell with two other two two other adults. That would have been, you know, at thirty years uh, in age plus Senior, sexually yeah. abused by both of them. Sexually abused by both of them that night, and then um, oh. um, then um, you know, and 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 and, and the bloke who I was charged with. Uh, he came to prison with me as well, and and you know, and he I seen him the next day, and he was in tears, and he told me that he he'd been abused, and um, it was crazy, you know. You just seen like, I I, I, I sort of know how uh, you know a, a girl, women must feel when they've got all these praying eyes of, of men on them, you know what I mean? Because the next day we went into this yard, it was like a, where they do a head count and everything, but and all these eyes of these um, old degenerates were sort of just looking at us and you know and there was like a, a an exposed uh shower block uh where you know you had to stand and there were no doors on the showers or anything like that and i, I was horrified of even having a shower course. how intimidating um, mm. and then um you know I, I i did try to report i said to uh, I said to one of the officers, I said, maybe can I just go in a cell with someone my own age? And they, were, you know, they sort of uh, were pretty angry at me, and and um, and in no uncertain terms let me know that weren't going to happen. And then um, I think it was a couple of days later, um, I was caught into a cell um, by a bloke who was a well-known negrophiliac at the time. It was well reported who he was, and um, and I was injected with heroin. Uh, um, uh, I'd never used heroin at that time, and uh, I, you know, I was really, really sick from it. And, um, oh. and, and I, I think that's where I, I would have caught hepatitis C from that syringe because it wasn't a clean syringe. And uh, you know, to be quite honest, I was that um, I was that much in pain mentally and that sort of thing. I, oh, I Russell, of would, like, I would, they could have introduced me with phosphorus acid or whatever, and I, and, and I wouldn't have bothered me, you know. And then uh, the sexual abuse continued there by him, and. Um, and, you know, and, and I went out into the yard and there was like um, a prison officer that took a, like a bit of interest in me and, and, um, and I said to him, you know, you've got to get us out of here, you know, what's going on? And, um, and I told him about the sexual abuse and he called the negrophiliac over and told him about it, like I just, oh you know, God. reported it. And, um, yeah, so life wasn't real good there and, um, you know, um, I had... It's, you know, the thing I think about today, I think if if a kid was under the docks or or, or fax or anything like that, and they say took him to a housing commission joint, and how's that kid in a, a block of units that were full of pedophiles and everything like that? You know, fax or docks would intervene and say, no, you can't have this kid there. No one come and see me. No Absolutely. one come and see me and check on my welfare. No one come yeah. and said, hey, are you you know, are you all right or anything like that? But I think I was there about six weeks and then um a guy from a uh, youth youth services or something like that, i think it was called back in them days come and see me and um he was a, a psychologist and um he was the first person to 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 see me and he he, he it would have been clear to him i wasn't in a really good state mentally i was really drained and and um i later uh, when i spoke to the royal commission i got to read that report and he said um there's there's a high probability that this child, the word was child, is being sexually abused um, uh, because uh, and, and would be vulnerable to being sexually abused because of his meek nature and surfy uh, surfy kid looks, you know, and um, 
but they didn't remove me. Like they were they aware didn't of that. Do anything. Yeah. There was they didn't there was no me. action. Whoa. Yeah, I was there for about three months, and then negligence, they didn't. isn't it? Oh, it is, and 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 you know, just I'd like to think it wouldn't happen in today today's age, but you just can never underestimate the government. And then um, and then about three months into it, one Saturday they've come and um, told me that I was going back to a boys' home, which where I should have been in the first place, and they moved of me to Mount Penang Boys' Home. Um, they moved me to Mount Penang Boys' Home uh, up at Gosford. And, um, but, you know, things had sort of, um, like, um, I, I got there and and uh, the superintendent, who is now charged with sexual abuse himself, he introduced myself to himself. And, um, and he, you know, he sort of... Um, told me everything was going to be all right. And he said, you know, you're not to tell anyone about you being abused or anything like that. This ain't the place to do it. And um, so he encouraged me not to say anything to anyone. He was aware of it. He was aware that that happened. You do know, you, was it, did he give you any reasoning why he didn't want no, you to speak? No, That's no, unusual, not, isn't it? Yeah. Them, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, um, and um, yeah, and then I'd done, I think I ended up doing 12 months and then, um, I got out of Mount Penang and then, uh, but I'd had a taste feral and I think I'd, even in Mount Penang, I'd used heroin a couple of times after uh, I'd been introduced to it at Long Bay and I sort of got a taste for it. And it was the only thing that made me feel numb because mm. I had like a really bad mm. void in me that I'd never had before. Like I'd, I'd, I'd look, I was, it was generated at Barrick and then it just was ongoing. And then, um, yeah. you know, I was, I was never a bad kid. I was never a kid that, hurt people or anything like that assaulted people or, or or anything and then um so i got out and i was out about oh i was out about eight no about 12 months oh no that was a bit more but, but anyway by the time i was 18 um i was back in jail but this time you know i was allowed to go to a mainstream thing which if they would have sent me to a mainstream prison from the word go, I would Not have never weird. been sexually abused. I would have been. It would have been way safer for me to be out there because it was, you know, no, there's no pedophiles, no rapists, or anything like that, and it would have been a way safer place for me to be, you know. And um, you know, um, and then I, you know, and then I sort of done my apprenticeship, like you know, I, 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 I like because I, I got when I got out released from Mount Penang, I ended up with a full blown heroin habit, you know, yeah. which, which led me to doing. I think I got caught with breaking in. Back in the day, I think David Jones and Myers was called Grace Brothers and I got pinched, got charged with breaking in some of them getting uh, like electrical appliances out of there and I got sentenced to 11 years. 11 years I got sentenced to. Oh. We were non pro period of four years and then, um, uh, you know, I just, uh, I, I used whilst I was in prison and, um, and, uh, because I, I just wasn't the same kid. I just always just, I, I don't know, I was always trying to escape something, yeah. you know, I was always trying to escape something. And then um, um, I've done two years on that one. And then, but in, in the meantime, I, I was fully, man, I, I, you know, I wanted to be able to use copious amounts of heroin to numb how I was. I, I just didn't want it to run out. And, um, and the only way I was ever going to be able to facilitate that was to be a Robin Banks and, um, so, um, you know, I got out. My, my, my family rallied behind me. Still, at that stage, I was too embarrassed to tell them what had happened to me. So you, you know, hadn't told your family at all? No. I was just, wow. But, yeah, but they, I, I, you know, with the benefit, after talking to them, I, I, you know, they, they sort of realised something wasn't right. I wasn't the same yeah. kid. And um, I... Um, you know, I, uh, and I, I tried to turn, I tried to do the right thing. I, you know, I tried working and everything like that. I was just, but there was just something stirring me all the time. There was something that I was at, I had a, I won't say a disease, but it was, I had a dis-ease. I was yeah. not at ease with myself, you know? Yeah. And, um, and um, I just, I just, my sleeping pattern, and even my sleeping pattern today is not the best, but I was ruined, you know, and um, because a lot of the abuse that Derek took place late at night, they'd Mm -hmm. drag you out of beds and everything like that. So my sleeping pattern has been ruined since Derek. You know, I've been one of these guys that wake up at one o'clock in the morning, I'll stay awake until three or four and then go back to sleep for a couple of hours. Nothing, that, that, that never changed after that. But, um, so, um, uh, I eventually, when after I got released from prison, I um I, I got charged with robbing five banks, 
um, over in the North Shore of Sydney. And then, um, and then um, I went to court one day and I escaped. And um, I got, I was arrested up in Darwin and I, um, I'd done a bit of jail up there and, and uh, for robbing the ANZ Bank of Parap up in Darwin. And, and that Darwin, man, I, like, I, I, you know, I, I seen that, that, all that stuff about the Don Dale um, boys' home where they're strapping kids to chairs and everything like that. That Darwin is a brutal place, man. Mm. Like, I, I was brutalised in there. Like, um, mm. more like this bashing them and treating them like animals and they'll get out and act like human beings don't work, let me tell you. No. Yeah, it does, that doesn't work. And that's what, that's, I think that's what, you know, the staff up there's take on things was, you know, I was in a, uh, segregation punishment unit for like nine months with nothing, um, nothing, no bed, no, like not even mattress on, on a slab of concrete. Oh, yeah. And um, on a daily basis, you know, I, I, I was punching on or getting bashed by so called riot squad who wanted to test or prove how tough they were oh, on me. Yeah. But they used to give me weekends off. They were really kind people and give me the weekends off to recover. Um, and, you know, I'd done like about nine months of that. And then I'd done a few years up, up in Darwin. And then, um, and then I got extradited back to New South Wales. I ended up doing about eight years. And then, um, you know, I, I, I sort of, I sort of, I got out and I got a really good job. And then, um, and I started a little business, a marketing business I had. And I had a couple of kids and bought a house. I'd moved up to the Gold Coast. And I, I really thought, um, you know, I was really changing my life around, but I was still haunted by this stuff. You know, mm -hmm. I was still having nightmares, and I, you know, which you know, I still have nightmares today. But um, I, 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 I was still having them, and I, so I started drinking, and um, the drinking led me back to drug use, and then ended up back in prison again. And then, um, and then, um, you know, I was on and off, uh, trying trying to straighten my life out, and just not knowing how to do it, not knowing. Yeah, you know, I'd never had a diagnosis. I'd never had a uh, diagnosis. I, I just, you, you, like for me, I just sort of accepted that's the way um, your life has been. So far. yeah, and that's yeah. this. Happened, this is how much. This is much how everyone deals with their stuff. You know, right? so it was like from two. Like I, was, I got out in nineteen ninety eight after, um, after uh, nineteen ninety eight after eight years, and I, you know, um. And then in 2004, I got arrested for another um, robbery, uh, this time in Queensland. And and then, um, it, yeah, it was just on and off, for, you know, until 2014, I got a, a pinch for robbing another bank on the Gold Coast. And, you know, where it all sort of started to change for me was, you know, I, I told my story to Royal Commission Institution Responses mm -hmm. to Child Sexual Abuse. And um, it was the first time ever that I was sort of ever um afforded sort of trauma counseling you know and i you know because i i just knew something had to change and and and, and you know I, I was carrying this toxic um secret that i didn't share with anyone and um you know and i say it in a lot of the work i do i was carrying um a backpack of stuff that didn't belong to me and that's guilt and and shame and embarrassment yeah. and anger Yours, you know yeah. And by telling my story, I was handing it back to the rightful owners, and that's the perpetrators, yes. themselves, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, that all sort of started. Uh, um, you know, I told my story to Royal Commission. Um, I was in a bit of a position uh, in prison. Uh, in prison, you got uh, if you're lucky, you'll have two phones that are side by side in a yard. Normally, to facilitate fifty people using them. And um, so you could be in a yard and everyone can know what you're talking about and how your kids are. Oh, Johnny's kids have played football today because everyone knows what's yeah. going on. And, um, you know, and I was talking to Royal Commission a little bit, little, I was ringing them and telling them little, little bits and pieces and what was going on for me. And um, anyway, um, people start becoming suspicious because they think you're talking to the police or something like mm -hmm. that because it's quite secretive and how you're going about it. So I, you know, I had to call fifty blokes and tell them, you know. Wow. Um, is that? Yeah, I had to tell fifty blokes what was and going that would on. Have been I had to one tell of them the, that I, was that one of the first times you'd spoken to yeah. people about it as well, right? So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was. It was one of the first times I'd, I'd spoken publicly, a part of basic public about it, mm -hmm. and I, so I, you know, I had to tell these fifty blokes what was going on with me and. Um, 
And out of that was sort of, I guess the voice of a survival was, which is my organisation, was sort of born, so to speak, because, you know, I, I had a lot of people come up and tell me after it, like the same thing had happened to them. Wow. And, um, and um, how, did the, you know, how did they go about this process that I was undertaking? And, um, and um, you know, and, and I'd sit down and, you know, because I, I was writing my whole story up in point form, uh, what had happened, and um, and I said, you know, and I, I showed, I showed some blokes. I said, this is, you know, what happened to me, you know, and, and blow by blow, and um, and um, you know, I ended up doing like, I ended up doing like four years of real intense trauma counselling on a weekly and fortnightly basis with a really good woman um, from Relationships Australia by way of phone. I never ever got to meet that woman face to face, but she really give me some really good stuff to work with and um you know and then um so and also started at that stage to undertake the compensation process mm -hmm. about the abuse because and, and, and but that was sort of um you know actually getting hold of my files and, and stuff like that from the boys home it was quite a, i was like uh, i had mixed emotions about it like you know because they knew about it all the way along what was happening to me and, 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 uh, you know, I was going through little waves of being angry about it and then sort of yeah. waves of being relieved. And, and then, um, so I went through the compensation process. Uh, I've done, I've done four years on that sentence. And, um, and, um, I, I, by this stage I've been moved to, um, to, uh, New South Wales, uh, prisons. And, and even there, I just continued on just telling blokes what I was doing. There's nothing sus going on. And a lot of, once again, a lot of blokes come forward and tell me their stories and, you know, and I put them in contact with the right mm -hmm. people. Um, I got out of prison and, and I was, you know, I was, as I was getting out of prison, I'd been awarded my compensation claim and, and, I, and, and I just didn't, I, I wanted them, I wanted that to sort of stand for something, you know, I wanted that to sort of stand for something and um, mm -hmm. I didn't want it wasted or on drugs or anything like that. So, so I, you know, on my way out of prison, I, I, I applied to go to a rehab to get, um, when I was getting released, so I'd go to a rehab. So that's so, so how it gets some, um, you know, because one thing about prison, you don't learn li living skills in prison. It's a skills, you don't, yeah. You yeah. learn about how to budget. You don't know, you know, um, you don't know anything about technology, that you're really starved of technology in there. And um, so I just wanted to go through a rehab. At that stage, I was nearly four years clean. I didn't pick up in prison. I just, just made it. Awesome. Because like, going back, when I got, when I got, pinched on robbing that bank uh, there's, there's another side to this story uh when i got pinched robbing that bank that i ended up doing four years over I, I like i'd made a commitment i said when i get to jail i'm gonna kill myself i had every intention of killing myself i just had enough i, yeah. I was so burnt out and um and i knew how i was gonna do it i was gonna use a coaxial cable to hang myself with and and um and uh, you know i got to the jail that night and someone had used cut the coaxial cable down to light cigarettes with or something like that. Sort of like a high power god job or court, whatever you want, universal mm. job. So, um, and then the next day, a guy came to my window, um, saw a window and he offered me a shot of a, a, a pupe or, or whatever it was. And mm -hmm. he said, I know you'd be doing it a bit tougher now. But I always suspected that same, I didn't like that guy, I never did. And I always suspected him of being a sex offender, which later came out he was. Uh, he was. And, uh, yeah, so what I did was, I, I, like I said to him, mate, no matter how bad I, I, I'm feeling or no matter how bad think, things were for me, I'd never take any ink off you, I said, because I've got a bit of integrity. And I said, I just couldn't take any ink off you, you know. So the cell doors open, I walk down the unit and there's a young kid sitting there and he's um, he's got this, all the books out and everything like that. And I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm studying psychology. He said, I took your tip those years ago and he said, Wow. And he said, maybe you should do it yourself, you know. And, wow. you know, by the end of that day, I guess, you know, by the end <clears> of that day, I'd, I'd sort of, I, I, there was just a, a little spark back inside of me and there was uh, to want to live. And that's when I decided to tell my story to the Royal Commission, you know, to Amazing. start talking to them and that. Fast forward it to getting out the four years, I, just a couple of weeks before I got out, I got awarded my compensation claim. I um, put that, I'll just, I'll give it to my family and said, just look after this for me. I don't need it at the moment. And um, I went for rehab and, um, you know, it was put to me by some lawyers, um, by, at the time, my partner was my friend and, and she, she was a, she was a lawyer herself, but she was actually a barrister at that, by that stage. And, and, um, you know, 
she she put it to a, a good a bloke who's now like a mentor to me, Professor Ian Coyle, who does a lot of trauma reporting, put it to me that you know you should you should do this. You know you should be you could really got a lot to help people with it. And um, so you know I ended up finishing the the rehab and I got my I stayed down. But the rehab was a Dell House based in Coffs Harbour, and um, and uh, and I stayed in Coffs Harbour for a bit, and I just got myself a little one bedroom unit and. Uh, and I thought, you know, where to go from here? And I, I had a few conversations. I said, all right, well, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it right, you know. So I went and bought a computer. And and by this stage, you know, I had 20 or 30 people had contacted me and said, look, help, can you right. help us do this, you know? And um, so I started doing it. I started conversing. I, 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 the, the company, the organisation was RJ Means Consulting initially, and then it went on to the voice of the survivor. I was driving along, you know. I was driving along in my car one day. I was going to the gym. And I thought, you know, the voice of a survivor. And I pulled over mm. and I, I put it in my notes in the phone and went, you know, I thought that's the name of it. Or it used to be RJ. I love Man, that name. The voice, yeah, the voice of yeah. the survivor. And 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 you, you see our symbol is the the the, the owl sitting on a key, and mm. um, and that was inspired by Mary because she used to say, you know, knowledge is power, and I'd say, yeah, wisdom is the key, and um, and and. And I got her a painting done when I was in jail of a big owl sitting on a key. I got a guy to paint it, and um, which we've got somewhere. And I'm gonna, uh, we've got it, we've got it somewhere still. And uh, I think it's in her chambers. But um, so yeah, the voices of I was, uh, and I was crazy. You know, I, I had, um, I had like, uh, you know, I had people take advantage of me because I had no technology skills. You know. <laughs> And um, um, I had, you know, one woman come in and, and, and want to be my business partner and she she seen dollars in it and she wants, she said, oh, you got to be charging them a lot more. I said, Listen, this, this ain't about money. This is, you know, about creating something that feels good for me and, and can help people. And, yeah, and, um, purpose. You know, and she ran off and kicked off her own thing with all my ideas and yeah, anyway. But... Um, Some people, so, huh? Know, yeah. <laughs> You know, I had one woman, one woman come in to do my typing and she'd turn up with all these crystals and put them all around me and do the chakra and all that sort of stuff. And I just, and that was all good, but um, I just needed to get <laughs> it, you know. But, you know, but we've really, we've, I'm just, I, I look at it now, what we, you know, we've, we've got, we've been, you know, we, we've been going for four years now. We've got mm -hmm. 12,000 clients and, and 12,000, um, 12,000. Yeah. Wow. 12, 000 that's clients. amazing. Nationally. Yeah. Nationally. Yeah. And, um, you know, um, it was really, it was, you know, initially ringing into the prisons and talking to people and, you know, and, and people just couldn't believe they were talking to me. I'd bring them up and I'd say, man, I'm here to do your interview. And they'd go, what do you mean? I'd be bringing them up on a legal call, you know, and ringing yeah. them up to do uh, their interview. And they just couldn't believe. And, and, um, you know, and I was really That's awesome. trying to inspire a lot of blokes from prison that turn their lives around and tell their story. But, you know, if you're going to get a conversation plane, do something with it. Don't just use it on drugs or, you know, and, mm -hmm. and uh, um, my, my, my compensation claim, I, I put a lot of that into kicking off the voice of a survivor and making that happen. And, um, you know, and it's the best investment I've ever made because, we, you know, to be able to help as many people as we've done. And it's just so fulfilling it's so fulfilling mm -hmm. where where i you know i, I live by the, by the rule these days so I, I try to give more than i take you know and and, and i and out of that i get a pretty good life you know I, i've got peace of mind and you know mm -hmm. I, I know the police ain't gonna kick my door down or <laughs> anything like that and that that's nice that, that's a really nice feeling i live in a real peaceful part of the world i've got a, a beautiful partner and i've got you know i've got some I've got, I think I've got 24 animals in total. I've got oh, I love it. Girls. I've just bought a miniature donkey. Um, a donkey? Yeah, from down Melbourne. Yeah, I just bought a miniature donkey. Nice. But, you know, Animals I, are beautiful healers yeah. as well. I think that would be something so great to yeah. have around you. And, 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 and you know, and, and Mary's always, my partner, Mary's always said to me how healing, you know, animals are. And I find that as, as yeah. long as I'm not picking up their dead their poos but uh, <laughs> that's a physical accident you know, but you know it's it, uh, <clears throat> you know and it's really important this i think you know this work and i you know and the work that we do but i, I think you know to every time i talk to a client and tell my story you know it's uh, uh, the, uh, it's part of my own healing process you know i really yes. i really feel that i really feel that it's part of my own healing process and 
you know, to be able to inspire other people to tell their stories and, 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 and you know, because, you know, a, a problem mm-hmm. shares a problem hard, you know. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, it's so we, 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 do, we do a lot, you know. I'm, I'm, I've got, a, got an office that's, you know, I don't know, for some reason, it never got out of Coffs Harbour, but it's a pretty big office down there. And we got, I think we've got 12 people in total um, working down there. 12 staff and, members working. Yeah, 12 Coffs staff Harbour. members. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. So, um, and, you know, I just, I, I love it. I, um, I you know, I, I sort of try to make myself to available to, to talk in community forums or, or, or whatever about this, because I think we can to, you know, I, I think people are, I think uh, young people in particular have got to feel safe to talk about this stuff. Yes. And, and they've shame got to- that culture, isn't it? The yeah, culture it, it is. It's, it's a been culture. around yeah. so long and the shame on the survivors. Yeah. It really needs to go back to- The perpetrators. It's the perpetrators. That, that's, yep. that, that, that shame belongs to them. And I think, you know, yes. when kids go, hang on, man, I ain't going to feel ashamed of this because this ain't my problem. This is yours. They're going to feel mm. more, than, more inclined to talk about it, you know. And, um, we'll, you know, and I, I, I really, really want to, really, I can't express that. that like, I, I come across people and they go, oh, I just don't feel right talking about it. Say, mm. well, because not everyone's ready to talk about it, but all yeah. I do is plant the seed and say, look, this is what happened for me. This is how I want to, yeah. this is what I did. And, you know, and if you ever want to talk, and sometimes people contact us, they'll start the process and say, I'm not ready for it yet. But 18 months later, contact us and say, I'm good to go. Yeah, that's you know, I've good. thought about it. I feel when good about ready. it. And, yeah. And when they're ready to talk about it, you know, because um, I'll tell you something now, it, 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 you know, if you get rid of these, these uh, perpetrators and that sort of thing, you'll halve your prisons. You'll maybe three yeah. quarters of them. So you would say, got, um, so from your experience of um, the people in prison, yeah. you would say, like, what sort of percentage were I'm victims of abuse, 60%. child abuse? 60? Uh, yeah, oh. I'm saying 60%. Yeah. I, I, that's in the men's. I, I reckon it'd even be higher in the women's. Yeah. And I that's re- only the ones that are willing to talk about it. Because yeah, yeah. you also say there may be people in there that are just like, there's no way I'm talking no. about it as well. Yeah, so. there, there's, there's, I, I, look, I, I go to places, I, 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 there's, there's indicators for me. There's indicators for me. If someone's got a propensity for violence, there's a fair, fair there, there, there's a fair chance that they're abused. Abuse, yeah. yeah and then no, there's no. that link of abuse to addiction. Um, yeah. Because it, it's just so homelessness. Insane. I go. No, I can. I go down to sort of Melbourne because the homelessness in Melbourne is really it's really visible. You know, in a lot of other cities, they hide it well. They'll hide it in refuges and, uh, and back yeah. streets and that sort of stuff. They'll put a soup kitchen in the back streets. Like in Sydney, they'll put one in Woolloomooloo to pull them off all the streets. You know, in, in, in Victoria and Melbourne in particular, it's, it's really visible, mm. the homelessness. And that, for me, that's always an indicator of, uh, of abuse. Um, mm. You know, uh, uh, yeah, obviously, you know, if I see someone stoned, uh, or like and something like yeah, uh, on on drugs or anything like that, is it that that's normally an indicator? Not all, but a lot. You it's know, escaping that pain, isn't it? Um, yeah. And I think you know, society is very quick to point the finger, like you know, drug addicts, etc. But it's like what has happened to those people up until that point in time, for them to feel the need um, yeah. to, to to just blank out and take away the pain. Yeah. Sure. I've seen it. I, like, you know, like there's this escalation in drug use. You'll get someone that'll smoke pot mm-hmm. and they might use speed or ice or whatever. And then they'll use heroin. Then they'll use heroin and take a handful of Xanax. And, you know, I mean, and I, I, I you know, I, 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 I used to see the guys that was on the heroin, on the Xanax and that, and they were just that club. Then you just know that they're escaping something pretty okay. deep, you know. Yeah, uh, you know, I just really yeah, sad. it's really sad. But you know, but you know, I think uh, 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 we as a community uh, have a job mm-hmm. to sort of be, you know, to not stand in judgment of, of those people yes. and understand why they are, why they are, yes, and then learn from why they are, and then and try to prevent it from happening again. Create solutions, yeah. yeah. Yeah, because what, like, what sort of support do most of those people have? No, there's nothing. There's nothing, yeah. you know what I mean? And it's really hard. Like, ring, uh, you know, these helplines or anything like that. People don't need, people need, 
something that's more personable, you know, mm -hmm. someone that's going to stand in front of them and cry with them, man, when they're going to cry, you know what I mean? And because, uh, you know, a, a guy who I, uh, an Aboriginal guy who I looked up to really highly in, in, in prison was a really tough guy called Tim Matthews. And, you know, he, he, he later on, he, I, I seen him on TV and he said, you know, I didn't realise there was power and tears. He said, you know, that's the, that's the, oh, that's the release foul. Release, for the yeah. Guy, you know, and, um, uh, and it's really important, you know, it's really important that we, we talk on social media, we talk in the mm. media, we talk in newspapers, we say, you know what, this ain't on, these protecting these high profile people or these yeah. people who work in boys homes or foster care or facts or boy scouts or school teachers and everything like that. You, you can't hide behind that, that the, 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 the survivor's not gonna say anything no more. You can't hide because they are, they're coming out and they're gonna talk about this sort of stuff. You know I mean? We've got to change the culture of this and it's Me really uh, this secrecy and this embarrassment. The Catholic, the Catholic church, what they've done is criminal. You know, yeah. like, it's just every facet of the way uh, of, of that, this, you know, of covering up. Um, you know, I've seen this interview with a Catholic priest once where he said, you know, I wanted it to stop, you know, and they just kept moving me to different parishes and, you know, and um, this bloke was a perpetrator and, you know I mean? like. That's got to change. It's you a know? cover up for it, isn't it? You know, yeah. the whole Pell thing was just disgusting. That was just yeah. disgusting. If, if George Pell, Brett, Brett, Brett Walker is the best Q, the senior counselor in, in, in Australia, he'd be $50,000, $60,000 a day. Now, if George Pell had to do what the victims had to work, legal aid and that sort of stuff, it wouldn't have got to the High Court. It would have been, no, mate, you're doing that. You know, George Pell. The, the victims don't have Tony Abbott and... and, and, and Making you know, out for them. Yeah, yeah always. All these, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. that, that, that for me was sickening. Like, because I remember Tony Abbott, Tony Abbott was strongly, and, and Scott Morrison, the current Prime mm -hmm. Minister, they were strongly against the Royal Commission Institution for Child Sexual Abuse. Correct. They said, no, there was no need for it. And look at the exposure that they give it. So you say, someone's got to question that. No one's, someone's got to go back and question him and say, why were you so vehemently were they hiding? Yeah. opposed to this happening, you know? Yeah. The that was, of okay. yeah. Yeah, it was, so, it, was, it was so tough, that Pell decision was so tough for a lot of survivors. It was like, because they just thought, well, this is going to take us back to the dark ages. And yeah. Come on, like, After actually like, coming so far. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like you know, he he was the architect of, of the Melbourne response. The Melbourne response was uh, a thing that was put together to show uh, them how to cover up for pedophiles and pay off survivors and and move them along Gosh, and everything money. like that. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. what, I, I don't understand. I don't. I, I don't understand why George Pell hasn't gone back. They haven't gone back and charged him with the similar charges that Brian Houston's just been charged with. Yeah. That's, Brian, covering it up like uh -huh. they've got a case on brian houston they've got a case on him yeah they definitely. have thousands of cases on him that have to have and these high profile it's so important that these high profile cases get charged and they do some time because yeah for sure it feeds down like the there's so many of them though you know that there, there's so many and uh, you know we, you, you, you gotta be like this that 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 99 year old 99 year suppression or that was just, mm. that is just that is sickening it's That's a slap true. in the face, you know what I mean? Like to every Royal, survivor, yeah. Yeah, the Royal Commission institution was a lot of it was it done a lot of good, but that wasn't one of them. You know, that wasn't yeah. one of them. Like the ninety nine year, that <clears> wasn't <throat> one of the good things. It changed the statute of limitations. Like if a kid in in previous times, if a kid was abused at nine years old, they had until they were twelve years old to 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 to, to, to take it to court and do it. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? When we know that it can take decades for people to feel comfortable. Uh, on feel average, for men, 27 years on average. Yeah. 27 years on average. 27. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So that isn't going to work. Yeah. And it's, it's, but there is change. And there's people like yourself, Gab, that are doing a really good job and, and you know, and, and uh, that are getting, you know, I think we're getting traction. We're getting some traction. Like, you know, you're not going to get it mainstream media, especially with that Murdoch press. No. No, you're not going to get it there. You're not going to get it there. Thank God. Like so, so social media, for all its faults, yeah, all its faults is uh, is one good platform for that. Us. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, you know, absolutely. For, for that, for that alone, and, and you know, but um, yeah. So 
today my life's, you know, I'll tell you something, I, I, you know, I still struggle. I still go through dark days. I, I still, I still do um, a lot of therapy. I'm, I'm starting to do what's called a, a, a type of therapy called EMDR. It's about going into subconscious, you know, because I still have nightmares, you know. I still, uh... my partner, you know, I, I have nightmares. My sleep is interrupted. I'd love to just sort of be able to, your body just wants to relax yeah i'd love to be able to get that back yeah a lot of survivors i'd love to be able to get that back but i've also you know because as a result of all the prison i've got i've got jail trauma too 23 years of being treated like a scumbag by prison officers you know yeah i've got that and i didn't realize how prevalent that was in my life until um you know I, i i you know someone talks to me in a certain tone like prison officers are always going to talk down to you. they're always going to talk down to you they're always going to talk to you like a piece of shit yeah and, and, talk, and, and you know i'm always pulling people up and say hey man you can't that it's not normal that's scarring to, that's so know? emotional and mental abuse isn't it yeah right? it continues on and and you know i always found in my case when i was abused and i i, I just i i don't understand what they were thinking what the, the the authorities back in the prisons, I, I I don't understand why on earth you'd want to protect a pedophile. Why wouldn't you go, mate? Did he do that to you? Mm-hmm. Rip him out of cell, get him ripped down a police station, get him charged yeah. or whatever. You know what I mean? You, yeah. You stop There's that no line. like they never took action on you. Yeah. Court at they all facilitated today. it. You yeah. Know, they, were, they, were, they were accessories before and after the effect. That's what they were. Yeah. And knew it was going to happen. They Enablers. thought. Honey, and one comment was made to me at Long Bay. That's what you'll get. That that should teach you a lesson for stealing cars. You know, that's what? not a sentence. Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? The court. You don't go to court and they say, "I'm going to give you 12 months, and you're going to be sexually abused by a pedophile and a negrophiliac." You know, that's yeah. not part of the deal. That is horrific. Yeah, but um, you know, it's that's man, I, you know, I'd like to think like I. I, I see some like comments about you know um, these kids having rights and like uh, in boys' homes and girls' homes or whatever, and I and you see these comments uh, uh, adults saying they should be sent to an adult jail. Well, what's that going to achieve? Yeah, that's, that's it. going to achieve. That's, that's so dangerous. And I think you know I, I I do know it's very rare these days for a child to go to an adult jail. It's still, I, I I know a little bit about the law, but they break every law. To send me to jail, um, I, I later found out that all everything was broken. The whole legislation they went against that. You know what I mean? I yeah. should have got, you know, I, I could have sued them for millions of dollars, but it didn't pan out that way. But you know, um, um, it was never my case. Was never about money when I when I sued them. It was about um, what happened with me. Is I, I, I first thing they do, you go to a mediation date and they give you an apology letter and. And, you know, that, that apology letter was worth more to me than anything. It was them yeah. saying, this is what happened to you. Acknowledgement. Yeah, acknowledging it did happen. Yeah. Yeah, finally. And, I that, and I, you know what? It was really good to be able to give that. To my, my oldest, my brother's wife, she's my, brother, my oldest brother's wife, I give it to her and I said, do you reckon... I said, do you reckon, you know, she let the family read that? And she goes, yeah, you got to, you know what I mean? Because, and, and it validated, like, they just give them a, a, a better understanding of why I was. And I think, you know, um, yeah. it sort of brought me back into the family file because I was that black sheep for a long time that they never yeah. understood, you know. There was this, I was this kid that they just didn't understand. So um, it sort of brought me into the family fold. And that, you know, that's all part of that. that, that Healing, that isn't cycle, it? You know, you, you get mm-hmm. distance from your family. Um you know, you're carrying all that, that, that backpack of that, all them horrible things. Yeah. And just to be to. understood, I can imagine, would have been such a healing experience. Like to yeah, have it's really important. Out. It's really important to do that, like mm-hmm. to have that. And today I do that. Now, today I think they're very proud, um, you know, what I do and, and how I go about and how I conduct myself. You know, today I don't associate with people that are, uh, are sort of doing crime or anything like that. I, yeah. I, I've really established myself in the community and I, I you know, and, and that judge went on the last sentencing, he, he described me as now, you know, once I was a public enemy, number one, now, you know, I'm an asset to the community. I didn't want to describe me as that. Yeah. You know? And I try to continue that work on and whether it's sort of mentoring um, young people, um, uh, you know, talking to 
the families of kids that have sort of gone wayward or whatever and um, you know and, and and doing that sort of work I just I love that I like you know I've got a few projects I had a I had a um a kid that worked for me um he was a he was a when I say kid young man he, he, he was the president of a, a, an outlaw motorcycle gang and, and he, he said, oh, mate, I'm, can I get a job with you? I said, yeah, you can. I said, but you've got to walk away from now. I said, because, you know, uh, I just, I mean, I, I just, man, them, they, they get terrorised, them blokes, they're, they're these bikey squads knocking on doors. These same bikey squads should be knocking on pedophiles' doors. But, yeah, be a good but, job. Um, but anyway, so he, I, he, he had to do it anyway and he walked away from now. I gave him a job working for me and, um, and then uh, you know, and I sort of mentored him a bit, and then you know, he ended up he ended up start uh, he ended up doing some study on tertiary prep, which is the equivalent of your HSC, and he ended up now he's studying law, and now he's got his own business, and, you know, and um, incredible, all from that. He goes out with a vet. He goes out with a vet who's related to my partner, and you know, he's turned his life around, and, and you know, it's, it's really good, and and, and you know, it's it's just oh, I get so much. I must get, I get growth out of seeing them stories. Yeah, how inspiring to see that change you're creating in the world. Yeah, and, and it's you... that whole thing. It's that whole thing, but it's it's about the work that we do. It's about mm-hmm. reuniting families too. Having that kid, that bloke or, or girl or, or whatever that was distant from the family because of drugs or whatever and, 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 and then going back into the family fold and, yeah. you know, and, and having a, a family member or saying, hey, man, that was just so good to see that to see the, uh, the kids and that's a support us. network for them as well going forward yeah. isn't it? We, yeah. we, and, and that, my you know my phone will ring all day long uh, with that sort of stuff but, but once again it's good for me it's part of the part of my healing you know it's part yeah. of my healing to be a part of that you know yeah. it's also part of my healing to, to create that awareness too you know and yeah um, i'm hell bent on that you know awareness is the first step of change and unfortunately the public is so unaware of so many of these issues with trafficking yeah. and yeah, they do it. They, sexual abuse yeah they do it and then they, you know like my for me i want to know why that person like i, I want to know what the yeah. underlying issue is of why that person is violent you know and the solution the person who's been punched in the head you don't care you just want to punish but you know, I want to know the underlying, the underlying, man, yeah, what man. makes you be like that? What makes a drug addict a drug addict, you know? You know, um, I want to know. I want to know that before I, I, I do my judgment and say, oh, yeah. well, I want to, you know, I, you know, I just want to ask a simple question. The simple question is, you know, what happened to you in your life to make you want to write yourself like off and go shoplifting all day or stealing all day or whatever? Yeah. yeah drug addict. What happened to you? All right, they cows abused, they had this or whatever. And that's that's when I can create an understanding about that. Yeah. That's and the solutions come from that understanding as well. Yeah. That the solutions never come from judgment. So Yeah, and that's that you know, we live in a society where everyone's finger pointing and everything like that. But as you yeah. say, they're not looking for solutions to the problems, you know, and, and I think we gotta really, you yeah. know, yeah. That's, and I think it's yeah. so it's inspiring to see survivors like yourself creating these community solutions because we can all see that the government is not doing that and there's such a massive massive need for it to happen. So yeah, yeah, we could we could like I look at prisons, right? I look at I look at I look at somewhere like Norway. I think I think Iceland has got the lowest recidivism rate. Their their recidivism rate's under six percent. Recidivism being returned repeat offenders and and i think you know from that point of view is like we we follow this american system of punishment and Mm. you know and death penalties and on all these sorts of things and retribution and and all that sort of stuff that stuff don't work i mean man them guys are being they're the biggest stuff ups in the world and i don't understand why we've got to constantly follow them and make up their mistakes. Why, you know, it'd be it's going to take a real because it's a hard sell. It's hard sell. Look, you know, these people in prison, we're going to start treating them like humans. And you know what? They might get out and act like humans. Mm. But this this notion of we will bash it out of them, we will beat it, we'll gas them. Like it's never. I remember. Worked. I remember. I remember coming down from Queensland, and um, and I went to the MWRC at Silverwater, and I, and I think of this thing a lot. What happened to me a lot, and and um. 
and um, I was in a cell at Silverwater and and the, the officers come in, there was about six of them, they had a dog and they were riot squad and that and they were doing cell searches, you know. So they grabbed my cellmate, take him out, one state, three, two, three, three, three officers stay in the cell with a dog squad, with a dog. And um, and um, this, they make me do a strip search. And um, and then they, and then, he, and then one of them handed me this plastic thing and he said, put that between your bum cheeks and I and to, to spread my bum cheeks. I was the bloke to spread my bum cheeks. And I said, I ain't doing it, you know? And uh, I said, I ain't doing that. And I said, that's sexual abuse, mate. I said, that, yeah. I, ain't doing it. I said, I ain't doing that. And he said, no, you, you're going to do it. And one was saying, if you don't do it, I'll break your jaw. I said, well, break my jaw. Whoa. I said, I ain't doing it. And then, and then the other one said, just let the dog go on him. I said, let the dog go on him. I said, I ain't care. I ain't doing it. I said, I ain't happening. I got a bit emotional about this because I've just been, I've been doing all this trauma counseling. That's coming that's up was, now. Like, you know what I mean? And I was sort of, they were just unpicking a lot of the really? sewing that I've been doing, like a, a lot of the healing I've done. I got all emotional. And I said, man, I ain't doing it. I said, you ain't sexually abusing me. You men with your guard dog ain't sexually abusing me. I said, I ain't happening. And uh, they were just livid. This and he was he was frothing at the mouth. He was so hyped up. This guy and I said, it just ain't happening. And I said, it ain't happening today. I said, break my jaw, skitch the dog on me, do whatever you want, get your rocks off. I said, but I ain't doing that. I said, and and, I, and, he, and he had his hand out trying to get me, trying to take. It. I said, I'm not doing it. Not happening. You know, and I that happened to me. And I can imagine how many other survivors those sort of things have happened to. You know yeah. what I mean? Um. Just that sort of stuff. That sort of stuff has got to stop. It's so triggering. Yeah, absolutely. you know what I mean. Oh, surely there's a, a a more humane way of um, doing, yeah. like you know, and and, and they'll jump. There's, there's a prison prison officers have got a side called the last governor. And they'll jump on there and go, "Oh, you poor thing, you were sexually abused." They 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 their, their whole thing is, "Oh, you poor thing," you know. Yeah, you know, I mean, they, don't, they just try to take the piss out of people that were sexually abused. They don't, they think there's no problem in it, you know. Yeah. Until it happens, that's, that's, you know, until that happens to one of them. Because I've had them, I've had some of them contact me and tell me stories about how it happened to them and they'd like to do, you know, tr they, you know, want to trust me. And, you know, what I mean, it's different when it happens to them or their children or something like that, you know. So, you know, drug addiction, you know. I remember, um, remember in the 80s, I think, you know, there was no funding for drug rehabilitation centers or anything like that until Bob Hawke's daughter ended up being a drug addict. And all of a sudden, all this funding comes out and all these rehabs are kicked off. Nothing ever, ever happens until it happens to one of them, until it yeah. affects one of them directly, you know. And um, But, you know, I, 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 I'm really sort of, you know, back to that. It's like, I'm always looking for things, you know. I, I like to watch a lot of podcasts and I... And um, you know, Learning. I'm always looking for different therapies. I, I think you know, for myself, I I've always got to do that. That um, I, I I try to do a lot of self soothing sort of stuff. Like you know, I um, I went to a rehab up here, and and I and, you know I got into doing yoga, and yoga I found that's really good for slowing my yeah. head down you know, and learning how to relax and how to meditate Amazing. and that sort of stuff. You know what I mean? It gives me. Um, such, these are such important life skills. They should be taught in prison. They should be taught in schools everywhere. Yeah, but they're not. Yeah. We're not taught how to manage our emotions and create no. better emotions. We're just. You know, but you know what? In prison or anything, like all these stupid, like all the courses, and that, that you're not even taught how to identify those emotions, what mm. they actually really are. <clears throat> you know what I mean? Because they, they want to put you. I, I remember I was in jail in Brisbane, and they. they, they the only course they were running was a responsible services of alcohol, <laughs> so like a bartender course. Like that's important. So how's that going to change my life? And and there's a fair possibility, there's a fair chance because of the criminal history check, I'd never be able to work in a bar anyway. Anyway, yeah. Seems like an um, odd job to be pushing to people that are... Well, you know what it is. Someone's getting a kickback out of a training college or something like that, and that's all yeah. that is. That's why that wasn't that bad. I never really learned um, a lot. Uh, yeah, there was one... There was one course that was in Long Bay Prison. It was called the Special Care Unit. It was run by a psychologist called David, Dr. David Swartz. That was the only course that was any any good. It was, uh, you know, but other than that, in that 23 years, I, I just there was never a, a, any. I, I I never come across rehabilitation. Yeah, anything that's reflective of it, you know. 
Yeah. And this bash him and all that sort of that's not rehabilitation. That's a, a you know that's brutalization. So you can't... many changes need to be made. Yeah. Yeah. And what page, you know, the, the page that we've got, uh, the Australian advocates for prisoners and their families, you know, we, you know, that's the sort of stuff we, we you know, I really, I really like that, uh, that Green Senator, David, not Senator, David Shoebridge. Mm -hmm. Have you seen him? I have, yes. Yeah. He's spoken out before in relation yeah. to, um, I think he actually called out um, Brian Houston. Yeah, yeah. Years, ago, years and years ago. Yeah. yeah he's a, he's a great Houston guy. You know, I mean, uh, we need more, you know, we need more blokes like, like sort of people like him, you know, and because this, you've got a current Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, who says by his own words, I'm being mentored by Brian Houston, uh, who covers yeah. up for pedophiles. That's dangerous. Yeah, it's dangerous, man. That's really dangerous. You got that same guy, you know what I mean, that was opposed to the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse, who exposed Brian Houston. Mm. You know, you know the, the, the question, big that, web. <laughs> it's crazy. It really it is. is. Yeah. It's crazy. We really need a, a complete change of culture in Australia where the protection yeah, we of child is called out. And, 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 and you know, we're, we're supposed to have people like yourself, Gab, that, yeah. that, that are willing to do that and, and are willing to get on the front line, you know? You yeah. Know? If nothing we all do that, nothing changes. Yeah. Uh, and I think for so long we've been taught, oh, you know, that's that's a mess. Someone should fix that up. But I won't you've be got made. to do it. It's not yeah. going to happen. Like, you've just yeah. got to get in there. Do yeah, it and we'll do that together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask you um, just before we finish up as well, would you be able to explain um, just for our supporters that might want to reach out for your services with Voice of a Survivor, um, what sort of areas you um, work in and what, like, how they can do that? And I'll make sure we pop all the links to your Facebook yeah. pages below as well. What we do is we, 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 um, what happened now? The client will come to us and um, they'll say they'll say sexually abused at the Catholic church or a school or a boys' home or a girls' home or anything like that. We will do what's called what's a pre qualification. You know, we've got people that'll sort of get them to talk a bit about their case in a trauma informing in trauma informed manner. They'll talk to us and that, and then we'll refer them off. We work with, um, I think there's about 26 different law firms nationally. Wow. Um, that's, yeah, a, that's a great choice that you've got yeah, the connections. But we insist with the law firms well. that we work with that, that that our clients are being treated with, with dignity and respect throughout this whole process, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you know, and, and the client can report back to us and say, oh, you know, they're not contacting me or anything like that, so we will contact them. So what will happen is they'll send them out a cost agreement, no win, no pay. Um, someone from my team will do the interview. The interview can take one, two hours about the abuse that happened to them. And if, you know, and if the client's... Um, wants to do half an hour look I, I, it's too triggering for me right at the moment we'll come back to it we'll facilitate that um, um, we hand it's called a statement of facts which goes part of the it goes part of the claim mm -hmm. and then um, we'll send that off to the lawyers and then um, and then uh, we'll support the client through the whole process like they're gonna go the, the next thing after that will be it might be a barristers conference um, We'll, you know, we'll give the client support. We'll tell them what to expect and and, and, and guide them through it. Not, not sort of guide, but we'll go through that mm. process with them. Yeah. Um, the next thing after that would be a psychiatrist or psychologist report, which can often be triggering uh, for for the client. But what we'll do then is, you know, we'll do a check in before and after, and sometimes a couple yeah, of days later, yeah, them, to make sure that they're yeah. all right. They're not, they're not too highly yeah. triggered. Um, and just the whole process, these processes can take from around about 18 months to two and a half years. That seems to be slowing up a bit, in particular Queensland, slowing them right up a bit. But, um, and then um, on the mediation day, where the mediation day, oh, we haven't had, we've got 12,000, 12,500, I think at the moment, we haven't had one go to trial yet. Generally, they go to mediation, which means out of court. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's settle, settling out of court. Yeah, yeah, yeah settling yeah. out of court. They, they, they know, the thing is, too, when someone might have a really, really good case, mm -hmm. and um, and the respondent lawyers and that just they, they don't want that exposure. So they they will say, "I oh, will give you a figure that you know yeah. um, that, that that's pretty tempting for the client to take." Yeah. Um, 
but the, the, certainly the mediation date will we'll support them through there. So we're on the phone and they'll say, oh, you know, they offer me this and you know what I mean? Like we, we don't give what we don't do and we stay right away from it. We don't give legal advice. We just don't want to do that. Yeah. We've got we're put in contact with really, really good lawyers who we believe in. That's incredible. And we believe their clients got the best interest. But what we'll do is we'll give them support. We'll say, you know, they'll say, I'm feeling this. We'll look, you know what I mean? And we'll talk them through it. Um, often even after the mediation and the settlement and that sort of thing, they might say, you know, my contact, like, oh, like from, 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 for me, like, I, you know, I got my claim. I didn't waste it. I invested in my business, which in turn, uh, you know, I was able to sort of do something with it and do something good with it. And, you know, and, and, you know, mm -hmm. we're just just giving people that support and yeah. letting them know that they're not alone, um, that they're not alone, and 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 their voice and their story means something. is really important. I think it's really really Lately. important. That, you know, what happened to you was wrong. We agree what happened to you was wrong, and we're going to support you in, in anything you can do. Anything, you know. Yeah. Um, a lot of these uh, client uh, people can be, you know, still going through the criminal uh, the criminal courts or anything like that. We put them right. in contact with really good lawyers. They're going to act in an ethical manner because not all, all lawyers, you know, we, we try to stand out like, you know, like, and, and even even when they get, you know, the, the bill for how much their claim costs, we'll challenge it. If, they, if they're not happy with it, we'll bring the lawyers, you know, mm -hmm. and ask them, say, why are they being charged this? And, and often we can get money taken off that for them, oh. you know, often. Often because, and because you know what you're dealing with this all the time, I guess you yeah. know. Well, we know what, and off. we also know what clients get in court. And, yeah. You know, if you get a lawyer uh, trying to say, "I accept this amount," you know what I mean, and I'll go, "Well, we had a client on the same, same perpetrator, same institution, two weeks ago, got X amount. This is what this client should be getting." You know, you do yeah. you make sure you're doing your work to make sure you get that client out because we know what they can get, you know. So well, you know, obviously, you know, um, we, we're an organisation, you know, we do invoice the lawyers, but the lawyers that uh, we, we we have don't take it out of the client's claim. They take it out, they, they pay for it themselves, you know, it yeah. comes out of their money that they get. So we insist on that. We insist that anything that, uh, any any charges that come come from us are disclosed to the client. That we're, we're but, but we insist that it's coming from them, not the clients, uh, the money. Because um, it is, look, at the end of the day, this was never, look, if I wanted to, if, the, if I wanted to make this all about money, I could charge three times the amount that I mm -hmm. charge. And it's not about money for me. And it, it's about getting justice for these people. Yeah. And, and you know, there was one guy, he'd done 27 years in prison and he got out and he, and he got, I think, about 300 grand. and. And he got he had he got out and he had liver cancer. He didn't have that long to live when he was getting out. But you know, the rewarding thing for him was he got out and got to have some memories with his kids. Mm. He went on a holiday, and, you know, bought his kids a car, and and and, and 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 like before he died, I had a good chat with him. He said, "You know what?" He said, oh, "You know, I'm glad I'm glad that process happened." He said, "Because I just I got some memories." He said, "I died with some memories." You know, he said, yeah. "Up until he said." Because I, if I didn't get out with that, he said, I would have been, it would have been pretty bleak. I would have been getting out to go and live in hospital or something like that, you know? And, and um, so it's really Changed important. your life there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, it's even myself, you know, you know today I, I'm, that's what I'm about, about creating memories, you know, about creating some good memories because that's some- That's what really matters. Horrible yeah. ones, you know? Yeah. You know, I had some horrible ones and um, it's about a good life, you know? I'm involved in the- in the boxing game, which I was always passionate, I was always dreamt of. I, today, today I have a life I dreamt about. You know, I'm involved. That's in incredible. So you've I'm worked involved. so hard for that as well. So yeah, yeah, and I and I do. You know, and, and, and you know, I, I work. You know, I work. I'm working twelve hours a day, seven days a week initially, and um, until I've got things in place. That, you know, and, and and even that is like. And, and people say to me, "Where'd you get your business acumen?" I said, "Well, I've done twenty three years in jail. I learned how not to do things mm -hmm. from the, from the staff." You know, because in there, man, if something works, they break it. You know, if yeah. something, if something's, if, if they get a course that's working, getting results, they'll get rid of it. You know, <laughs> that's crazy. Unreal, that's that whole, yeah. you know, and, 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 but, um, that's where I got my business acumen from is like, I've always been a bloke that's always been, um, likes to keep fit and, and that sort of thing. So I've got drive from that. But I've got an obsessive compulsive trait from a drug addiction. Mm -hmm. When you put that into a business, yeah, you're using it to your advantage. <laughs> yeah, 
yeah, it's the unfair <coughs> thing, so they say. Yeah. But um, I've got that. But um, it's just that drive. It's just having that drive, mm-hmm. uh, and that. And I think you know, when you when you when you're passionate about something, and you and you add those other factors in, you can't go wrong. You know. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, with and it's rewarding. It's so rewarding. Uh, you know, it's so rewarding uh, changing these people's lives and, and and giving them something and a bit of something. You know, and you know, yeah. Yeah. people get these payouts and that sort of thing, and it's up to them from there on in. You know what I mean? You want to do something with it. You know. Um, you know, and it's sad. There's some like I had a guy contact me today, and he, you know, he's blown it all, and he and mm, really, I, you know, but, yeah. and, but it, it's sad. But but at the end of the day, it's like you know, I mean, we're like, but but in saying that, he's he's blown it all. But I'll still support him. I, like you know, what I mean, I'll still put him in contact with with counselors and that sort of yeah. stuff. Because yeah. it's important that you know he, you know, okay, he's blown that, but it's it's, it's important that he still he, he doesn't deserve the suffering. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I guess some it just depends at what stage people are at with their healing. Yeah, well, doesn't it? So, which can be so different. It took me a long time. It took me a long time to to get it, and but um, you know, but uh, you know, it's it's a good feeling. It's like it's just a nice. It's it's just nice knowing, you know. Knowing all of, of what it did to me and how I went about it, and I don't have to repeat that, you know. So amazing. It wasn't my fault, you know. Yeah, yeah. So empowering just to be able to take all that shame and trauma from, yeah. from a survivor and say it actually belongs with a perpetrator. Yeah. So yeah, thank you no. so much. Um, hey, thank you, Gab. I really appreciate your yeah. time. No, I appreciate your time. And um, I know that as supporters, we've, we've had a lot of people reaching out that are considering um, taking cases to court. So I yeah. really wanted to have a chat to you because I thought, you know, what a fantastic resource for people to know about as well. So keep up the amazing work. Yeah, and you keep up the amazing work too. I really respect you. Thank you. Thank you. We're, we're all in this together, giving a voice to people, which is um, yep. it's healing individuals and it's healing the world. Let's do it. Let's do it.